All right. Hi guys, I'm Dante. I'm Lawrence. And for this video, we're going to discuss um, biomechanics specifically, what the anomalous role is in human function, and how restrictions in the anomalous can actually translate to um, relevant problems, whether it's pathological, like clinical things, or performance stuff. We have these illustrations to kind of guide us along the way. Boom, boom, and boom. Uh, Lawrence, why don't you take care of this, and then when you feel ready, we'll transfer off and I'll take care of that. All right. So starting off, we have here a nice illustration of your pelvis, primarily consisting of your two anominates, which is the actual part, portion of your pelvis, and your sacrum, which is part of your spine sitting in between. So the primary function of your nominates as a pelvis is to form the primary link between your upper body and your lower body. It's where uh, your spine sits upon, as well as what actually moves as part of your walking pattern. And so Dante is now coming over here with a skeleton for us to show you this. One moment. Whenever he gets here. All right, he's putting up a fight. So here is our lovely skeleton. Just get those arms out of the way. Yeah. So here we have our two anominates. In between you can see here is the sacrum, part of the spine. As you can see, there's no other direct connection between your upper body and your lower body, except for through the anominates. And as you can see by the joint, this is not a joint that actually supports your upper body like a column. As you can see, if we're not for these screws here, your spine would actually sink straight through them. So what holds up your upper body are ligaments, which are not seen because this is a skeleton and there's no, nothing else illustrated here but bone. And we can further show you this from the back. As we turn this around, just bone, this would all fall through were it not for ligaments that are not seen here. All right, gravity. Gravity. So, going over motions of the pelvis, or rather the nominates, building off of what Jamie talked about in a previous video, we're going to illustrate the nominates with our hands, as you cannot really see this all too well in a picture. So here, we, again, just going over really quickly, we have our ASIS, illustrated by my index finger here, and my PSIS, illustrated by my thumbs, and we'll pretend my pinkies are leg lengths. So, if you imagine a vertical axis, your anomalies can rotate in and out, like so. If you were to imagine a horizontal axis going straight through my palm, you can imagine the anomalies rotating forward and backward on either side. And lastly, just by virtue of the joint here and there, they can also have a shearing movement motion going up and down, vice versa. So in any of these motions, which are normal in some degree, they can also get stuck. And when they get stuck is when you have a dysfunction. For today, we're gonna to talk about a right anterior nominate. So how that would look like in a person would be the right side will rotate forward. So what this means is your P ASIS here in front will be lower than on your left side, whereas your PSIS will be higher than the other. This would be illustrated in another picture later on. And what this becomes a problem in is when you're discussing motion and actual motion. So moving down to illustration here, we have two models. Over here, we have three segments connected to this joint here all as one piece, whereas this model has three different segments that are free to move. And if you were to have them all turn in the same direction, or swing in the same direction, in this model, with all three stuck together, kind of all the force is concentrated on just this one joint, where then you get more grinding, versus this one, where you can have turning to achieve the same motion across multiple joints, the load is shared across all three, so generally, Less damage, better for your body. So in conclusion, more freedom of motion means less stress for each joint. This also causes problems in, in static motion, or rather not motion, but static mo Static. static. Stance. 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 As Dante will explain now. Okay, I guess I'll talk about stance. Uh, the other side of this equation, okay? So you have an anterior anominate on the right, uh, illustrated here, and we're gonna display it on a body on this side. Here we have a baseline, more or less neutral body. And then to the left of it, we have what 
a right anterior anomaly would look like in actual, you know, in posture. With the right leg longer, either one of two things would happen. Uh, with the right hip forward, I should say, one of two things would happen. Either over time the left leg starts to deform and start to lean in to compensate for the extra length, or, less dramatically, to compensate for the fact that the right hip is longer, the left leg actually has to go out further from midline to change center of gravity in order to you know, account for that extra length of leg. Now, what that would do is that would tilt the entire pelvis and, well, dramatically, if we had that happen, you would look like this. The issue with that is we don't actually walk around like this. Like, anterior anomalies are pretty common, but not everybody walks around with a side lean. So what happens is we start inducing these curves to kind of correct everything, the goal being to keep the head more or less level. We are actually programmed in a very interesting, sophisticated way. No matter what the problem is, our eyes stay level. So if your left leg, if your right leg becomes longer and your right hip dips down, all of a sudden your vertebrae have to curve in and kind of weave back and forth in order to dissipate that and keep everything straight. So whereas you have something nice and clean like this guy over here, with this fellow you have, you know, these points leaning this way, these points leaning that way, and so on and so forth. And my goal here is to convince you that this compensatory curve is actually a problem. So, easiest way to illustrate it is actually to you know make a nice schematic of a vertebrae. Here we have three blocks stacked together. This is what happens when there is a lack of dysfunction, good motion, so on and so forth. The weight is evenly distributed from top to bottom. It's not focused anywhere in particular, and this is more or less a stable structure. The alternative is, let's say the bottom most piece is tilted as so. Now what happens is everything has to kind of bend back and forth in order to compensate for that. Now force, when you load force, because gravity is a thing, guys, when gravity starts pushing itself down, pulling itself down, depending on you physics people, now we start having force concentrated on one end versus the other, preferential to the other. And this can lead to significantly more wear and tear than this. This is nice and even. This is jagged, borderline shear forces. I want to say shear, but it's not quite shear, but it's close enough for now. What this can do as far as clinical problems is you can end up with various forms of back pain, like pain in your back because of your hip position, because this, if it's significant enough, can actually pinch nerves or over time can actually wear away at the cartilage and bone. On the other end of things, on the more you know, sports and performance side of things, if your hip is out of position, let's say this hip doesn't move and all this vertebrae are kind of kinked back and forth, try to lift something, try to carry something heavy, try to deadlift, try to squat when all of this is going on, you'll notice that things don't feel quite right. Um, I weight lift very aggressively, it's the kind of thing I like to do, and what happens is, when I have any of these dysfunctions, what happens is, I try to pull something heavy and I start to lean to one side versus the other and I actually have to focus a lot of mental effort into stabilizing everything inside of me to make sure the weight actually comes up and I don't actually kill myself. When I don't have these dysfunctions, when everything is nice and mobile, I don't have to focus on that stuff anymore and I can just focus on the lift itself and suddenly um, I deadlift 355 pounds last week. Pre-treatment, it it, it's difficult. It, take, it knocks the wind out of me. I gotta recover for days on end. Post, uh, we tried the same thing after treatment and it was a hell of a lot easier. 355 pounds gave me hell before, now it flies up like it's nothing. And really the only difference between that was the fact that my hip was mobilized nice and clean one day versus the other. So I guess in closing, not necessarily in closing, but kind of bring this to the next point. When you have an anomaly dysfunction, what happens is this. I don't know, where can we go with this? What do you think? Closing words? So, simple point, your problem is not where it hurts. Back hurts, could be your pelvis, or your feet hurt, could still be your pelvis. This will come again true in other videos later on, basically. Also, if you want to squat heavy weights, get this done to you.